Hey everyone, it's Sarah the Registered Nurse, RN.com, and in this video, I'm gonna be talking about the fluid and electrolytes that you need to know as a nurse, specifically their causes and signs and symptoms. Now, I have a complete playlist that you can access where I talk about these electrolyte imbalances individually, specifically their nursing interventions and treatments. So whenever you get done watching this comprehensive video, you can access those videos as well. So let's get started. We need a proper balance of fluid and electrolytes in our body in order to maintain life. We don't need too much or too little. We need a specific range. In fact, 70% of our body is actually made up of water. And here you can see the function of the water in our body. It's found in our brain, in our muscles, bones. It helps transport nutrients and oxygen into the cell. Also, our blood consists of 83% of water. But this just isn't plain water. It consists of many things. And one thing it consists of are electrolytes. So what are electrolytes? Well, we're going to be talking about six main ones, such as potassium, sodium, chloride, calcium, phosphate, and magnesium. So these are substances that once they enter the body and they are dissolved in water, hence our blood, they actually produce an electrical charge, hence become ions. And this is very important with electrical signaling in our body. So some things that electrolytes do in our body are the following. They help with contraction of muscles, sending nerve impulses, creating bones, balancing the fluids in our body like our cells via osmosis, and maintaining the blood's acid-base balance. Therefore, whenever we have these imbalances of these electrolytes, you're gonna start to see certain abnormalities in these processes, depending on if it's high or low. For example, with contraction of muscle, in certain electrolyte imbalances, you can start to see muscle spasms or your heart, which is a muscle, will start to demonstrate abnormal EKG findings. And it's very specific to certain electrolytes. And as we go through this lecture, I will highlight that for you. But now let's talk about how electrolytes are maintained in our body. How do we keep them from being too low or too high? Well, we get electrolytes majority from our food whenever we eat and drink. And it goes into our body and majority of them are gonna be absorbed in our gut. So if you have a gut problem, let's say an issue with your small intestine, that can affect how you are absorbing certain electrolytes. Then it enters into our blood and you know that your blood has to be filtered by your kidneys. And just remember the kidneys. Really, if you have any kidney problems, you're probably gonna have an electrolyte problem. And your kidney is made up of all these little functional units called nephrons. And the nephrons, in a sense, what they do is they take your blood and they create filtrate out of it, which in the end is going to be urine. And it's like a little pipe. I like to think of it as it runs through the kidney and the filtrate is gonna go through certain sections of that pipe, we call them tubules, and certain electrolytes and water and other things are gonna be taken out of the blood and put in the filtrate or it's going to stay in the blood and you're gonna keep it in your body. So whatever your body doesn't need as it tweaks these electrolytes, you will urinate out as urine. So think about it this way, if you have any problem with the renal system, you can affect the electrolytes. Hence, a lot of times they're gonna be really high. So that's why many times patients who have high abnormal electrolytes will need to go for dialysis because that dialysis machine is gonna replace what that kidney's nephrons should be doing. In addition, we can manipulate the kidneys and by giving them diuretics. So a lot of times if we give too much of a diuretic, we can cause these electrolyte imbalances. So other ways our electrolytes can be affected is that if we have an exit route for them, and this could be anything. It could be trauma, it could be where we've had a lot of blood loss or we've had burns, or the patient's just really sick, they're throwing up a lot through vomit or they have diarrhea. Maybe they have um, suction, NG suction, we're sucking off too much of those gastric juices, which are rich in many of our electrolytes. Or the patient has some type of disease process, and you're gonna see that a lot with the causes, like problems with aldosterone or ADH, the anti-diuretic hormone, etc. Now let's look at these electrolytes individually. First, I wanna start with sodium. So sodium is a really important electrolyte that loves to hang out outside of your cell. So there is a higher concentration of sodium in the extracellular part 
compared to the intracellular part where there's a lower concentration. Now sodium plays a huge role in regulating the water inside and outside of our cell along with muscle contraction and nerve impulses. So if you get an imbalance of this electrolyte, you're gonna to start to see issues with these processes. A normal sodium level is about 135 to 145 milliequivalents per liter. So anything less than 135 is considered hyponatremia, and anything greater than 145 is considered hypernatremia. And you wanna remember the higher the number or lower the number with these ranges, you're gonna to start to see more profound signs and symptoms, the worse off the patient is going to be. Whenever it's just a little bit over, a little bit under, it's gonna be very mild. So now I want you to see a visualization of how sodium really works in that extracellular area and affects the cell. Here we have hypernatremia conditions. So in the blood, there's a lot of sodium hanging out. And you wanna remember that water loves sodium. So wherever there's a higher concentration of sodium, that is going to pull water and water wants to be there. And think of it like this, if you eat a lot of salty foods, what do you start to crave? Water. So it's almost the same concept. So we have lots of sodium in the blood. The water that's in the cell is going to be pulled outside of the cell. And this is going to cause the cell to shrink up. Now on the flip side, hyponatremia. We don't have a lot of sodium in the blood in that extracellular part, low amounts. So the water's like, hey, we're lonely. So there's some inside the cell. Remember, there's a lower concentration, but there's some. So that's gonna cause the water and the extracellular part to be pulled inside the cell. So what's gonna happen? The cell is going to start to swell. Now let's talk about the main causes of hyponatremia. What can cause the sodium level in the blood to drop? Well, not consuming enough sodium can do that, along with giving a patient a medication called a diuretic. Diuretics are typically used when a patient has fluid volume overload. They have too much water in their blood. So we're going to manipulate their kidneys to pull that water off and they're gonna urinate that out. And the diuretic family that does that tends to be the thiazide. So they influence the kidneys to really waste sodium and they're gonna be wasting it in their urine and it'll drop our blood level. Also, anything that's affecting our GI system because your gastric juices have a lot of sodium in them. So vomiting or GI suction with an NG tube that can waste the sodium level along with the potassium level as well. Diarrhea, sweating, which contains a lot of sodium, and Addison's disease. So let's do a quick re review about Addison's disease. This is where a patient has low aldosterone. What is aldosterone? Well, it plays a role with our blood pressure, helping us maintain our blood pressure. So normally it will cause the kidneys to keep water and sodium because that will increase your blood pressure. But in exchange for that, you're going to excrete potassium. So if we have a low level of aldosterone, how's that gonna affect the water and sodium? It's going to cause you to lose it. So you're gonna lose your sodium. But on the flip side, it's gonna cause you to keep your potassium. So that can cause that. And also SIADH, which stands for Syndrome of Inappropriate Antidiuretic Hormone Secretion. And this is where they secrete too much ADH, which again is antidiuretic hormone. What does this do? Well, whenever we're diuresing someone, we're causing them to lose lots of fluid through their urinary system. Well, if we anti that antidiuretic hormone, that's going to cause them to keep water, not urinated as much. So we're gonna have more water in the body. And in turn, that's gonna dilute the sodium. Some other conditions that can do that as well is whenever we have overload of fluid in the body, like with congestive heart failure, giving the patient um, too much of a hypotonic solution or renal failure. Now let's look at the signs and symptoms associated with hyponatremia. So to help you remember those signs and symptoms, remember the word salt loss because we have a loss of sodium. S is for seizures and stupor. So stupor is where you have a decrease in consciousness like confusion and this can be associated with the nerve transmission being affected along with, depending on how severe it is, those brain cells start to swell. A is for abdominal cramping. L for lethargic, 
T for tendon reflexes diminished, trouble concentrating. L, loss of urine and appetite. O for orthostatic hypotension, overactive bowel sounds. S for shallow respirations, and this happens late due to skeletal muscle weakness. And then S is for spasm of muscles. Now let's talk about the main causes of hypernatremia. What causes our body to keep too much sodium in our blood? Well, if you have some issues with certain hormones, like in Cushing syndrome, our body is keeping too much cortisol. So we have an overproduction of this. And this, remember from our other lectures, plays a role with the stress process. So some functions of cortisol would be to help us maintain our blood pressure with the inflammatory process. So if we have too much of this, we're actually going to keep too much sodium in our blood and we're going to waste too much potassium. So we'll have hypernatremia, but hypokalemia. In addition, Kahn's syndrome can cause hypernatremia. And this is also known as primary aldosteronism. And this is where we have too much aldosterone being present in our body. Over here, we had Addison's where we had low aldosterone. So it's gonna cause the opposite effect. So with this, remember the normal ro role of aldosterone was to maintain our blood pressure with the water and sodium and excreting potassium. Well, if we have too much of this on board, we're gonna keep too much water and too much sodium, hypernatremia, and we're gonna excrete our potassium and we can drop our levels and get hypokalemia. In addition, hypertonic solutions, giving a patient too much of a salty solution, as I like to think of it in the blood, and corticosteroids can do this. If a patient is not drinking enough water that can concentrate the sodium in the blood, or if they're losing too much water. And a condition that can do this is like diabetes insipidus. That can happen as well. The patient is going to be urinating so much with this condition. In addition, burns can cause this, and an increased intake of sodium can cause this condition as well. Now let's look at the signs and symptoms associated with hypernatremia. And to help you remember those, let's remember the phrase, no fried foods for you. And a lot of times fried foods are packed full of sodium. So we know we're dealing with a lot of sodium here. So the F is for fatigue. They'll feel very tired. R is for restless, really agitated. They're gonna be confused because you're having central nervous changes. I for increased reflexes. This can progress to seizures and coma. E for extreme thirst. This is a huge sign. Remember this one. And then D is for decreased urinary output and dry skin slash dry mouth. Now let's look at the electrolyte chloride. So I want to do chloride after sodium because these two electrolytes really go together. If there is generally a loss of sodium, there's also going to be a loss of chloride. And you're going to see a lot of overlapping causes and signs and symptoms. So chloride is very important for helping maintain our acid base balance because of its its relationship with bicarb. Also, it plays a role in digestion because we need it in order to make hydrochloric acid. And it plays a role with balancing the fluids in our body with the help of sodium. A normal level is 95 to 105 milliequivalents per liter. Now, chloride levels are maintained with the help of our kidneys. They tweak our blood and decide, okay, how much chloride we need. If we don't need a lot, we're gonna excrete it. Also, it's excreted through the sweat and the GI juices. So if you have some issue with the kidneys or sweating too much or GI juices, chances are you can imbalance your chloride levels. So let's look at hypochloremia. So this is where we have low blood levels of chloride and some main causes are typically GI related where the patient is losing a lot of chloride through vomiting or their gastric juices like suction, or if they have an ileostomy. Um, an ileostomy also can cause hyponatremia because this is where a surgical procedure has been created to bring the small bowel on top of the skin so the patient is having effluent, which is stool coming through that. Now this is really rich in sodium, also chloride. So if they have where they're putting out a lot of effluent, that can cause these levels to drop. Also, diuretics can cause it, thiazides, that was very similar to hyponatremia. Burns and cystic fibrosis. With cystic fibrosis, these patients lose a lot of chloride, especially through their sweat. 
And patients who have fluid volume overload, like heart failure, SIADH, that's gonna dilute the chloride. And metabolic alkalosis can do this as well. This is where we have a high level of bicarb, and this is going to drop our chloride level. And the reason it does this is because bicarb and chloride have this like opposite relationship, especially in how they shift in and out of the red blood cell to help with proper gas exchange. Now the signs and symptoms of hypochloremia don't have their own specific ones compared to these other fluid and electrolytes. They typically are gonna be associated with whatever's causing this problem. And if you can really remember the signs and symptoms of hyponatremia, you can remember what hypochloremia is gonna be because they really overlap. So you may see dehydration signs and symptoms with an increased heart rate along with a decreased blood pressure, fever, vomiting, diarrhea, or being lethargic. Now let's look at hyperchloremia. What can drive that chloride level up? Well, it's gonna be similar to the causes of hypernatremia, because again, sodium and chloride really go hand in hand. So consuming too much sodium can drive the chloride level up, like giving the patient too many hypotonic solutions. Also, the patient not drinking enough or losing too much water can dehydrate them, raising that sodium level up, along with the chloride. Decreased bicarb level, whenever the bicarb drops, that can increase the chloride because of their opposite relationship. So losing too much with maybe having too much diarrhea. Also, the Kahn syndrome, this is where they have the increased aldosterone, so the patient is going to be retaining a lot of sodium, but excreting potassium, and that can elevate our chloride level. Medications like corticosteroids, and then metabolic acidosis can do this as well. Maybe a medication leading to this condition or some type of renal problem. Now the signs and symptoms of hyperchloremia are similar to hypernatremia and acidosis. Now let's look at the electrolyte potassium. So potassium has an opposite relationship with sodium compared to how chloride had the similar one. So chances are if you have a high sodium level, you're gonna have a low potassium level. If you have a high potassium level, you're gonna have a low sodium level. And this is because, you know, potassium is mainly found inside our cell. There's a higher concentration there. Sodium, the higher concentration was on the outside of the cell. So they work together to help balance that fluid within the cell, plus they play a huge role together with the sodium potassium pumps. Now, the role of potassium is big with muscle contraction and nerve impulse. So if you have an imbalance of this electrolyte, you're gonna start seeing issues with this. A normal potassium is about 3.5 to 5 milliequivalents per liter. So as you can see, it's a very narrow range, but it's a very important electrolyte. So let's look at whenever we have hypokalemia. So we have low potassium in the blood. What are some main causes of this? Loop diuretics can cause this, like furosemide. It causes your kidneys to waste potassium. So that's a big thing you gotta watch on those patients. Corticosteroids can do this, and if a patient has too much insulin. The reason for this is because insulin makes potassium move inside the cell. So if we're causing it to leave the blood and go inside the cell, we're dropping our blood levels. Cushing syndrome can cause this. This was the high cortisol. So again, it decreases the potassium, increases the sodium, and we talked the reason for that earlier. Starvation, patients who have been under extreme conditions where they haven't been able to eat can cause this, or losing too much potassium, and this is again found richly in those GI juices. They're like vomiting or um, GI suctioning through the NG tube. Now what are the signs and symptoms that you may see in a patient who has hypokalemia? So we have a low potassium level in our blood. Remember that everything is going to be low, but it's also going to be slow. So remember the seven L's, L represents low. So the first L is that the patient is going to be very lethargic and they can be confused. Second L is for low, shallow respirations. Third L is lethal cardiac dysrhythmias. 
They may have ST depression, a shallow T wave, or a projecting U wave. Fourth L is lots of urine. They can have frequent urination where the kidneys are just unable to concentrate the urine. Fifth L is leg cramps. Sixth L is limp muscles, and they may have decreased deep tendon reflexes. And then our last L is for low blood pressure and heart rate. Now what can cause hyperkalemia, where we have too much potassium in our blood? Well, anything that really causes the potassium in the cell to move outside of the cell into the blood is going to raise those blood levels. So if a patient has severe burns, this can occur along with tissue damage, such as the condition like rhabdomyolysis. This is where you have the breakdown of muscle tissue. So when Whenever that muscle tissue is breaking down, it's leaking potassium into the blood, hence increasing it. Addison's disease can do this, and again, this is where we have decreased aldosterone. So we're going to be um, excreting our sodium, but increasing, keeping our potassium. Renal failure, a lot of times whenever you have patients who have an elevated BUN and creatinine, you are going to definitely see that potassium level increase very high. A lot of times they need dialysis to bring it down. Medications can do this as well, like those potassium sparing diuretics like spironolactone and ACE inhibitors can do this and NSAIDs. Now, what are the signs and symptoms of hyperkalemia? Well, to help us remember those signs and symptoms, let's remember the word murder because if the potassium level gets too high in the end, it's going to murder the patient. So M is for muscle weakness. U is for urinary output is going to be little or none. This is very common in patients who have renal failure. They're putting out like no urine. R is for respiratory failure. Whenever it gets so high, those muscles are gonna just quit working and they're not gonna be able to breathe. D is for decreased cardiac contractility. They're gonna have a weak pulse, low heart rate. E for early on, you're probably gonna see muscle twitches and cramping. And then R is for rhythm changes. And I would remember this. They are going to have tall, peaked T waves. You can also sometimes see prolonged PR interval. Now let's talk about the electrolyte calcium. This is an essential ion that plays a huge role in the health of our bones and our teeth, along with muscle and nerve conduction and clotting. So in order to maintain a good level of calcium, we have to have a diet that's rich in calcium. So our gut plays a huge role with us absorbing calcium. And once we absorb it, what we really don't need to maintain that good blood level is going to be stored in our bones. Now our bones will monitor our blood levels and if those levels are low, like in hypocalcemia, what will happen is that the bones will actually start to release calcium into the blood. But if this ha keeps happening over and over, it's going to make this bone really weak over time and the person can have osteoporosis break their bones. Now calcium is really regulated by three different things. One, vitamin D. It's very important a person has vitamin D on board in order to absorb calcium. Also, the parathyroid hormone, PTH, and calcitonin play a role with this. PTH is produced by the parathyroid gland, and calcitonin is produced by the thyroid gland. So, if you have destruction to these glands, or maybe a patient's had surgery, we can alter calcium levels if we hurt these glands. Now, a normal calcium level is 8.5 to 10.5 milligrams per deciliter. So, let's talk about what happens whenever we get a really low level of calcium. We start to experience hypocalcemia. So what can cause this is a decrease in the parathyroid hormone. And typically this is gonna happen with patients who've had surgery of this structure, especially like a thyroidectomy. So if you've had a patient who've had, who's had thyroid surgery, check their calcium level because we could have damaged that gland. A decreased intake of calcium, for some people this is very hard to keep their calcium levels maintained, especially if they have lactose intolerance. So they'll have to be very conscious about making sure they get enough calcium through other sources. Having a low vitamin D level can cause this as well because vitamin D plays a role with us absorbing calcium. Chronic kidney disease because the kidneys are wasting too much calcium. Bisphosphonates can cause this as well. This is a medication that's actually used to help treat osteoporosis, so to make those bones stronger. And how it does this is it helps decrease the release of calcium, but sometimes we need the release of calcium into the blood, and if we don't get that, we can have low levels. Also, another group of medications include the aminoglycosides. These are antibiotics. They end in myosin, M-Y-C-I-N. They cause the body to waste calcium via the kidneys. And then some anti-convulsants like phenobarbital. And this affects the vitamin D levels in the body. Now, what are the signs and symptoms of hypocalcemia? Well, we know that our muscles and our nerves are definitely going to be affected. So let's remember the word cramps. C is for convulsions. 
R is for reflexes hyperactive. When you check those deep tendon, they will be like that. A is for arrhythmias. They will have a prolonged QT interval if it's severely low enough. M for muscle spasms in calves or feet. This is known as tetany. Then P is for positive signs. And these are signs that you can see in a patient who has a really low calcium level. So one of these signs that you definitely wanna remember is called trousseau sign. And this is where you can take a blood pressure cuff, put it on the arm, inflate it to a number greater than their systolic and leave it there for three minutes. Now, if it's positive, you will notice the hand will draw in toward the body and flexion will occur at the wrist, thumb, and MCP joints, but the fingers will remain extended. Then another sign that you want to remember is called Chabotstick sign. And this is nerve hyperexcitability of the facial nerve, specifically that cranial nerve seven. And to elicit this response, you're gonna tap via the masseter muscle at the jaw's angle, and the facial muscles on that same side that you tapped will contract momentarily. So the lips will twitch. And then S is for a sensation of tingling and numbness, known as paresthesia. And this can be felt in the fingers and toes. Now what can cause hypercalcemia, increasing the blood level of calcium? Well, if you have an overactive parathyroid where you're having too much parathyroid hormone in the body, because parathyroid hormone is going to cause the release of calcium. If we have too much, we're gonna release way too much calcium in the blood. Next is increased vitamin D usage because vitamin D helps us increase our calcium, helps us absorb it, so we have too much that can increase it or using supplements with too much calcium in it. If a patient has cancer that has spread to the bones, this can affect calcium levels because it causes too much calcium to leak into the blood. And then medications, some main ones you can remember are like the thiazide diuretics can do this because it affects how the kidneys are absorbing calcium. And then lithium can do this as well because lithium can affect the parathyroid hormone causing the body to have too much calcium. Now, what are the signs and symptoms that a patient has too much calcium in their blood? Well, this patient is going to be extremely weak. So W is for weakness of the muscles. It'll be very profound. E is for EKG changes. And remember, they can have a shortened QT interval. A is for absent reflexes. Um, they can also have altered mental status and abdominal distension from constipation. And then K is for kidney stone formation. So these patients are at risk for the development of kidney stones. Now let's talk about the electrolyte magnesium. So this electrolyte likes to hang out inside the cell, just like potassium did. And it has a function in nerve and muscle, which plays a role with the sodium and potassium pump. So with this pump, you have ATP. And what happens whenever magnesium binds with ATP, because ATP needs it in order to function, it's going to move three sodium ions out of the cell and two potassium ions into the cell. Therefore, we need a proper balance of magnesium in order for this function to occur. In addition, it plays a role with our vessels, maintaining our blood pressure and how our muscles contract and relax. So with magnesium, what happens with contraction? You have calcium. That's the big one that plays a role with that. But in a nutshell, magnesium competes with calcium for that binding spot. So whenever relaxation is going to happen, we have magnesium that allows that to happen. So think about this. If we didn't have enough magnesium, if it allows us to have our muscles relaxed, what's gonna happen instead? Instead, your muscles are going to have spasms, they're gonna cramp and have contraction issues. So magnesium is mainly absorbed in our gut, specifically our small intestines. So if we have issues with our gut, as you're gonna see with our causes, we can have issues with balancing our magnesium levels. And magnesium imbalances will more than likely present with other electrolyte imbalances, like that of calcium and potassium. So a lot of times, if your calcium levels are low, your magnesium levels will be low and vice versa. Now a normal magnesium level is 1.5 to 2.5 milligrams per deciliter. And if you can see that range, it's very narrow. So let's talk about low levels of magnesium in the blood. This is known as hypomagnesemia. And what can cause this is not consuming enough magnesium or we have some other electrolyte imbalances like we have issues with calcium or potassium or we have malabsorption disorders of that small intestine that can cause that, or they are taking a PPI, a proton pump inhibitor, that can decrease the absorption of magnesium. 
and patients who have alcoholism can have this as well. Now let's talk about the signs and symptoms of a low magnesium level. So with this, you wanna remember the word twitch because everything in the patient is really going to be excited. It's gonna be hyperactive. On the flip side, whenever you have a high mag level, everything is going to be really slow and not hyperactive. So T is for Trousseau sign and Chavot stick sign. And this is related to also having a low calcium level, so hypocalcemia. W is for weakness. I is for increased deep, deep tendon reflexes. Again, everything's gonna be hyperactive. T is for torsades de plant. And this is an abnormal heart rhythm that can lead to sudden cardiac death. And it can be a lot of times seen in patients who have alcoholism. And then another T for this part is tetany, those seizures and other EKG changes that go with the calcium and the potassium being decreased. C is for calcium and potassium levels low they'll present together and then lastly is H for hypertension because magnesium helps with our blood pressure and having a low amount can make those vessels more likely to lead to hypertension. Now let's look at the main causes of what can elevate the magnesium level in the blood known as hypermagnesemia. Well this condition is relatively rare it tends to happen whenever we're trying to correct a low magnesium level so we give them too much or you wanna monitor a patient for this condition. If they're an OB patient, labor and delivery, the patient has preeclampsia and they're receiving magnesium sulfate. So we wanna monitor their mag levels to make sure we're not giving them too much. And you're checking those deep tendon reflexes, making sure they're there. Because if they're not there, we may have a problem with our magnesium level. Also, renal function can mess this level up as well, causing us to keep too much magnesium. Now with this condition, with the signs and symptoms, everything in your body is going to be lethargic. It's not going to be really hyperactive like over here. So let's remember the word lethargic. And typically with this condition, you're only gonna see it in severe cases. Mild cases may not present with signs and symptoms. So L is for lethargic and may be profound. E is for EKG changes with prolonged PR and QT intervals and maybe a wide QRS complex. T is for tendon reflexes absent or grossly diminished. H is for hypotension. A is for arrhythmias like bradycardia, heart blocks. R is for red and hot face. They're going to have flushing. GI issues is for G, nausea and vomiting. I is for impaired breathing due to skeletal muscle weakness. And C is for confusion. They can have neurological impairment. Now let's talk about our last electrolyte, phosphate. So phosphate plays a role in teeth and bone building. It's stored in the bones. It's absorbed by the gut and excreted in the kidney. So any issues with those structures, we're gonna have an imbalance of phosphate. It's also regulated by the parathyroid gland because the parathyroid gland will tell the kidneys to inhibit, inhibit reabsorption. And then vitamin D influences how we absorb phosphate. So are you seeing the parallels between calcium and phosphate? They have some similarities. So a normal phosphate level is anywhere between 2.5 to 4.5 milligrams per deciliter. So let's talk about if we have a low phosphate level in the blood. This is known as hypophosphatemia. What can cause this? Over usage of aluminum based antacids too much of this will block the gut's absorption of phosphate low inner level. Also starvation and refeeding syndrome can cause this. Refeeding syndrome occurs when a patient has experienced severe starvation, they haven't had any food. And then whenever we give them food, it can increase their blood sugar because that's what it normally does. But because they've went under such extreme conditions in their body, when this insulin is released because of this high blood sugar, it's gonna need phosphate to change glucose into energy. So that is going to further deplete those phosphate levels leading to the low blood levels of phosphate. Also, an overactive parathyroid can do this because if we have too much parathyroid activity, we're going to majorly inhibit how the kidneys are reabsorbing phosphate. Hence, we're really wasting it all and not getting it in our system. And then low vitamin D levels can cause this as well because vitamin D plays a huge role in absorbing phosphate. Now let's look at the signs and symptoms of hypophosphatemia. And to help you remember the signs and symptoms, let's remember the word bone because phosphate is huge with our bone health. So B is for bone pain and fractures. O is for osteomalacia. And this is where you have softening of the bones. And whenever you have this, especially in children, it can affect their growth, making them shorter. And it can result in the bone 
growing of the legs, how the bones are formed. N is for neurostatus changes. They can have irritability, confusion, seizures. And then E is for erythrocyte destruction. So phosphates play a huge role with our red blood cells. So we can have our red blood cells being destroyed and this can lead to hemolytic anemia. Now let's look at elevated phosphate levels in the blood, also known as hyperphosphatemia. So over usage of phosphate containing laxatives like Fleet's enema can cause a high phosphate level. So if a patient has renal failure, you definitely wanna watch using those. Too much vitamin D on board can cause it as well. Rhabdomyolysis can cause this. I mentioned this earlier. This is where the muscles start to become damaged when they break down. That contents of the muscle is going to go to the kidneys because your kidneys filter your blood and it's going to damage your kidneys. And when your kidneys get damaged, we're not going to be able to deal with phosphate like we should and we'll keep too much and have high levels. And then hypoparathyroidism, so an underactive parathyroid. What's going to happen instead of normally being able to inhibit reabsorption of phosphate by the kidneys, we're not going to have that and so we're going to keep more so that will elevate the levels. Now the signs and symptoms of hyperphosphatemia can be similar to that in hypocalcemia. So patients with high phosphate levels may be experiencing convulsions, they may have hyperactive reflexes, arrhythmias, spasms in their muscles, they may also have itching. This is found in a lot of renal patients and they can have signs of trousseaux and Chabot sticks. Okay, so that wraps up this review over fluid and electrolytes. Now don't forget to access the free quiz that will test you on this material.